Welcome to Crushing Serpents, Uniformity Through St. Joseph. You're here with Gabe, Conrad, and Alfonso. This is episode three, and let's open with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Joseph, terror of demons, cast your solemn gaze upon the devil and all his minions, and protect us with your mighty staff. You fled through the night to avoid the devil's wicked designs. Now with the power of God, smite the demons as they flee from you. Grant special protection, we pray for children, fathers, families, and the dying. By God's grace, no demon dares approach while you are near. So we beg of you, always be near to us. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. So before we uh, get into the, today's wonderful talk, uh, Gabe uh, is going to give us a little rundown, just a recap for those that are uh, hopping on today and uh, see where we left off from last time. Yeah, for sure. So last week... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we were talking about obedience as far as it pertained to the lady and the clergy. And I think a lot of it turned into uh, talking about uh, COVID and, and, and such and the regulations and things like that. And so it's interesting. I, I was I was reading this morning about the uh, new travel restrictions announced by Justin Trudeau. All hail our supreme leader, JT. Um, and he, it was something to the effect. Actually, let me pull it up right now. It was something to the effect of what the new quarantine policies are going to be looking like and i thought it was really interesting so it was i think right here if you test positive you you're going to be required to quarantine in government facilities to ensure they are not carrying the more transmissible variants of the virus and this is on www.msn.com us news so it's, it is out there. This is not just a gape theory. This is <laughs> factual. So what do you guys think of that? Qu quarantining in government-made facilities. Could we call these uh, camps rather than facilities? I think some people were calling them camps. No, oh, yeah. That was, the, that was the name. Bring your sleeping out. bag. Get ready for some uh, s'mores and some ghost stories. That kind of camp. Or well, it's, it's hard to concentrate if you have that kind of thing there. So I don't think you're allowed to socialize and sing. Oh, yeah? But I guess if, if you're having to concentrate, you know, on quarantining, then and it's a camp. Maybe we could call them, I don't know. A concentration camp? Oh, oh, you see the light bulbs going off over people's heads. Wow. No, but it, it's it's interesting because I another thing that was on that site was like you need to get tested if you're if you're leaving the country. You need to get tested as you're coming back in. Uh, they they were talking about okay, well if you do test negative, you're you're allowed to um so you have to pay your uh, out of pocket to stay in a hotel, have all of these sorts of accommodations, and then when you do go home and you're awaiting your test results. Uh, the the website at least is saying that you're going to be under increased surveillance, whatever that means. I wonder if they're going to have people patrolling or, or checking up on you every now and then. But it's oh, I definitely hope so. I love the government coming spying on me, <laughs> dude. I need a friend. I'm so <laughs> <laughs> actually just a friend. You're no captured. <laughs> yeah, you're only FBI agent. <laughs> <laughs> Friendly neighborhood. <laughs> you just be like, hey, welcome to the comedy zone. <laughs> the communist zone. That's oh, right. Whoa. Uh, yeah, so um, what what do we got in store for today, gentlemen? Let's... Well, well, uh, non vinum habent. They have not wine. And uh, beautiful spiritual analogy. Um, you can draw so much from this, this uh, font of wine, of wisdom. Um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the extraordinary power of the liturgy to change the world, to sacramentalize everything, to realize that in the beginning... God created the world, and he saw that everything was good. And this is such a beautiful um, vision, this enchanted, mystical vision that the medievals very much had, that we've lost, and you're seeing the exact opposite, the demonic attack on everything in this world, like literally everything is just an onslaught. And so as soldiers of Christ, we obviously have to fight the good fight and fight back by you know, reappropriating everything from language to these great gifts of um, drinks like wine and beer and so on and so on and it starts with um the liturgy adoring god right and realizing how he transforms everything you know blesses everything because it's good and holy so tell me alfonso how can wine be holy like, like, <laughs> well, isn't this something you just drink oh my goodness this is this is a loaded question <laughs> this guy this guy you could say it's pack a bunch you <laughs> <laughs> that was a strong strong question for some strong drink you know yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm trying, I'm trying, guys. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny because, like, it's not just wine, too, um, even though that is, I think, essential. Um, it, it may Why is it essential? So, well, 
see I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll paint the picture first right so you're a secular person uh, maybe never raised with any religious stuff and you stumble in upon this ancient weird Latin thing and you're like what the heck is going on you know and then you just see this this mass and it's a probably a solemn high Latin mass and you see the smells and the bells and the chimes and the symbols and you're just like what is going on you're mystified you're thinking this is weird you know and it's funny because our culture you see things like anime where we're hungering for something foreign we want to travel we want to experience things that are different and exotic right and mystical and that's why people get into like crystals and buddhism and you Mm -hmm. know and new age stuff especially but you stumble upon this this solemn high latin mass and you smell the incense wafting through the air and the and how it's changing the room and then you see you see the beautiful vestments of the priest robed like a king in these royal glorious vestments hand sewn even passed on for maybe a couple decades if not hundreds of years Um, and then you hear the choir singing like angels and you hear the bells ringing you see the host being elevated and you're just like wow what is this and so you know maybe this is some people's first encounter with a solemn high latin mass with the liturgy of the church but you notice all these signs and symbols, these gestures, these smells, uh, and all the senses are pointing you from the sensory knowledge to something deeper, to right. this deep spiritual truth. Your intellect is mystified and trying to comprehend what is this universal thing mm-hmm. here. And it's God, is his presence in a very incarnational way. Like, And that's why we as Thomas, the blessing is, the incarnation was so fundamental to this world. God became man, the word you know, was made flesh. And that means God created creation good and he wants to enter into it and he wants to bless things, you know, through his baptism. He actually sanctified the waters of this world. So we were talking the other night actually um, with our Ukrainian uh, Catholic friends, you know, joking around about this. These really have um, different symbols, but they're equally beautiful and complimentary in many ways. And I'm just, I'm saying all this to paint the picture of, you have things like bells, uh, wine, salt, olive oil, bread, uh, beeswax candles, right? Um, you, and and you think, oh, okay, you know, they're just whatever, right? They're just it's your everyday, yeah, accoutrement. But they're not, and, and that's exactly it. You're like, what? Well, what do you mean? And even uh, something as simple as beer. And this was one thing this year. Um, some friends of ours started up a, a beer club, and they've been having fun. And uh, I got them to read this book called The Beer Option. And I'm still working through it. It's really good. And uh, it addresses so many problems in our culture, but also it re-sacramentalizes something as simple as beer. And it shows the church's prayer for beer. And you guys may find this funny, but it calls it, O creature beer. It refers to beer as a living thing. And mind you, it's probably because of the yeast, right? But Holy Mother Church with the monks would bless beer and refer to it as this living gift. Could you say that it's from the yeast? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you can uh, tell, our jokes are getting elevated. They're rising up here, you know. It's, uh, it's bubbling to the surface. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the reason I bring this up is because, as you can tell, everything that's human is under attack right now, especially uh, socializing, especially for good friendships and normal human interactions. Like we can't even sing; it's ridiculous, right? But these little things too of retransforming our vision of the ordinary and making things extraordinary and ordinarily simple and beautiful because the LCBOs um, and liquor stores throughout the Western world are still open and people say, why the heck are they open? Why are they in essential service when everything else is being closed, right? And it's like... Got to keep people in good spirits. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. But the danger is the exact opposite of people becoming alcoholics because they don't have this vision, right? Right. You can't incorporate the social element into your recreational uh, drinking and things like that yeah and so this is where it begs the question of why does the church value these things so much gold and silver and wine and bread and all these things why are these considered precious right and it starts with one that view that god has made everything good Mm. and two how he blesses and transforms it and so what i've always ranted to my guys and you know maybe it's because um italians are the best and uh yeah maybe maybe that's it but uh Mm -hmm. no i actually uh not kidding around i think uh cultures have been baptized in the faith for thousands of years they have cultural elements that are just so precious that reflect these deep spiritual truths and one of them is the value of bread and wine and all these things and so what i always say to my friends is look at what the culture devalues and right there you'll see what is important 
So we attack bread as an example. We attack bread with uh, bastardized Wonder Bread and Dempsters, and you see all these preservatives and uh, all this attack on gluten too, right? And people becoming celiac and all these artificial, artificial preservatives and on and on, right? And you know what? There's a lot of truth there in that lots of breads aren't going to be good for people. Lots of these artificial things that are store-bought in a plastic bag sitting there on the shelf for months and months, you're kind of like, hmm, yeah, okay, maybe this isn't the healthiest. And the culture you know, is having this conflict right now. It's like, well, it's delicious and whatnot. And, and it goes on with all these health food trends, right? These things, people are confused. Are they good or bad, right? Aristotle says the golden mean, right? You need to have right consumption of good things in moderation. Um, and this is true, but also the quality. The church has always said that bread is something so pure that God used it to become like incarnate in the sense of he became man, but also he gives himself fully to us in the Holy Eucharist. So the church uses pure wheat bread. You know, you can't use anything else. So if the devil wanted to attack, you know, human beings, grace builds upon nature. So attack man on the natural level. Get his body to be predisposed to not appreciate these great gifts. So what you do is you bastardize bread. You give him terrible bread and you make him hate bread because it's so unhealthy. And then you say, oh, go receive the Eucharist now. And people are like, oh, but, you know, bread's bad, isn't it? You sow confusion in these little ways, right? But at the same time, you're actually weakening their faith. Have, have you seen this instantiate in the concrete? Because to me, hear, hearing something like that, it, it seems to make sense on paper. And yet, it, it uh, I, don't, I don't know, it almost strikes me as unfathomable that somebody would have that reaction. It seems absurd in, in a way that somebody would... No, no, and that's a, that's a very fair point. Well, I'll, so I'll beat the point home with all the sacramentals and, and not just limit to the one. Carry that over with wine, right? And wine, same thing. The church has always said you need to have pure wine. Our Lord, so the opening thing, non um, non vinum habent, right? They have not wine. The wedding feast at Cana, a joyful celebration, our Lord's first miracle, where he enters into the, his ministry for three years, starts off with making wine, or sorry, water into wine, right? And so from this spiritual analogy, and this this great you know mystery that we see unfolded, our Lord institutes the Holy Eucharist with bread and wine, and it's from the deep spiritual tradition of you know ancient Israel, right, of our forefathers in the faith, and the Church has always continued this, and it's something that's essential. This Holy Sacrament, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, cannot be offered without wine or bread. So these are very precious things, right? The church is always trying to preserve them. So what does the devil do then? Attack wine, attack wine at all costs destroy wine. Napoleon and every other great uh, dictator that's caused war, they always destroy monasteries, they always destroy sources of uh, vineyards and brewing, and they always make sure that the church has shortages of supplies, right? That's warfare, right? You want your enemy to have a shortage of supplies. That's number one. Mm -hmm. But two, you develop uh, an extreme culture. Either people become Puritans and think that all alcohol is evil, and you can see that in the concrete. Every single Protestant denomination holds that alcohol is evil. Or the exact opposite, you have a gluttonous culture that only views um, any drink that has alcohol in it, one, as the same, and two, its primary purpose is for drug abuse, to get high, to get some sort of euphoric effect, to just abuse it so that you get intoxicated and wasted. And yet, that is the primary problem. The, you know, Aristotle talks about understanding the nature of things and their purpose, right? Their final end. And funny enough, wine is distinct from beer and beer is also distinct from spirits these are three separate categories and there's a, a great blessing to distinguishing because it's not alcohol it's like calling uh coffee just caffeine it's not actually coffee and tea are fundamentally different right there's so many different different types of teas they both share one property though a property right it's not the essence but they share a property and that's caffeine right so too with wine and beer and spirits Yes, there's alcohol in it, but there's different levels and also there are different substances because wine is actually nutritious. The reason why throughout human history, so many cultures have always drank wine and beer is for nutrition, funny enough. And you study the history of it, and that's why I love the beer option. I'd recommend it to anyone or the spirituality of wine. Wine and beer are nutritious. They actually have health benefits. But if you bastardize it to a certain point and then produce cheap stuff and overdose it with sugar, now maybe girls' night out is on that level. I'm not an expert. Gabe, what can what can what can you say for us about girls' night out? Well, I think it's an unpopular opinion. There's definitely some stigma around it, and I don't know whether or not it's fair, but it's classified as a woman's drink. Like now, you say something like a Mike's Hard Lemonade or a Pinch <laughs> or, or something. Like that. Be, Pers as Catholics, are those things that we should? 
<laughs> well, I here's the thing. I I don't think it's like I I is this a joke? Is there's a yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> stuff true. Right. No, I think I don't know. I I definitely enjoy it on occasion. I think personally, and I'm gonna be very honest for a second. I know that it's considered very uh. Maybe, maybe, well, maybe posh is the word. Oh, you want to sip some nice scotch and some nice brandy. Oh, it's a very nice taste, you know, and just let it sit on your palate. I've I've tried it. I'm not a big fan. And so, personally, and you, and you might, I think Alfonso, you might take issue with this. If, if I'm offered, if I have a choice between strawberry watermelon girls night out or your finest brandy... <laughs> I'm probably wait, gonna wait, take Frank? the girls' night out. No way! I, oh. I, I probably, I'm not joking. I probably would. I think with that said, I mean, just to bounce off of what Alfonso is saying, is that we we see, like it's like in 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 response to like what what some kind of like the Puritan mindset of of alcohol is be evil, it should be avoided. I mean, you do see like many Protestants hold this belief. And to some extent, there's truth to it in the sense that you abuse alcohol. Um, you consume it just for the sake of getting drunk or for the sake right. of, of, of getting that buzz and that's it uh, and like maybe that's the primary and the secondary is oh it kind of tastes good or even with these with these sugared drinks it's like like the reason why people buy it is because it doesn't taste like alcohol and it tastes, right. sweet. It tastes like Sprite you can you can just down it to mix it you know <laughs> and then, yeah I mean you see this with high schoolers right Right. Like, they're more gravitated towards that because mm-hmm. obviously a high schooler is not going to drink some of the finest scotch because <laughs> their palate is developed at that point. No, it's 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 um it's for those other reasons. So it's interesting that you say, Alfonso, those those ideas that um like beer, wine, when they're pure, when they're good, when they're made right. well. Because you see this you see this all the time with the with the monasteries, right? With the monks making these beautiful Trappist beers that just taste so good. Right. You just No, no, when it comes to that stuff, I I, I can't remember the name of the, the uh the Trappist beer that I I had the other day, but that was amazing. Among the best that I'd which one ever had. Uh I I can't remember what it was called, but it but it was really good. I'll try and find it. But here I think going off of your point, Alfonso, I think it was interesting to sort of bring up the line between artificial and natural, and how it extends to all things, not just not just uh, like the sacramentals that you're talking about. And I think it's a really interesting point to think of. Satan doesn't create; he just perverts good things. He just dilutes things and waters them down so much. Well said. And well said. It, it it's really neat to think about. Even how what you're talking about, like uh, New Age occultish spirit, spiritualism, is that there's this void there. There's this longing with people. They they know that there's something more, and and they're looking for it. They're looking to satisfy. Even what you're talking about, foreign films. You know, people are looking for things outside of themselves. And they're looking to satisfy it in the wrong areas, oftentimes because nobody's nobody's showed them church. Nobody, you know, nobody's showed them how how great the ma- mass is and things like this. And so, what do we do? We 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 see what our friends are doing. You know, we got these cool, neat little tarot cards. We're gonna get into this because it it brings you that sort of artificial euphoric. Uh, buzz so to speak like like girls night out or <laughs> well, that appeal to, to curiosity right right tapping into those areas that you know we don't know or those kind of like yeah people get excited about oh you yeah, know all this all this kind of paranormal stuff and 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 even um like even considering that uh like going into those areas or, or trying to achieve something supernatural um without natural means Right. Um, or through, through, this, through like trying to achieve something supernatural through, you know, drugs, alcohol. Right. Through through different substances, through tarot cards and all these kind right. of forms of like black magic and whatnot. Um, it's a. Uh, it's it's interesting. There's like a, there's definitely a danger there. Right. No because you're tr- you're trying to fill that spiritual void. People are spiritual and physical. That's that's. Our nature and but the, the spiritual has been not only diluted but neglected because it's been so diluted it's well th- there's no difference between the spiritual and physical you can account for everything by looking at chemical balances in your brain and things like that and that's all spiritualism is and it's like no that there's there I think I think there is more truth to that idea than people might believe in that we, well we are to our, our nature is uh, body and and spirit 
and and so I think what you do to one affects the other but we can't completely divorce those two um, realities because that that's that's where it takes us today and 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 now people there is still that longing that spiritual element and so people are going to like people are leaving the church in record numbers but that's not to say that they don't want to be nourished in any spiritual dimension they do it's just they want the quick fix like like the artificial things you know they go to the lesser things because it brings them in a more immediate uh, satisfaction and, and and sort of you sort of lose that notion of the arduous good having to work for things in order to get a greater uh, to reap greater benefits from them and so I think it's really interesting Alfonso talking about like the Wonder Bread and the Dempsters and things like that let give me the lesser thing instead of the uh, you know uh, Gabe could you go into a bit more detail about the arduous good there because I think you made, made a good point there this idea of of seeking something that's different. Yeah, that's something that we can't understand because, because I mean, even this idea that people are leaving the church, right? And like, what's like there could be many different um, reasons associated with that. For sure, it could be you know lack of lack of virtue or seeing like the abuses in the clergy, right? Um, but I think I think it's fair to say that most most people, especially nowadays, with with the records that like in the states right now, only like one third of people of of Catholics believe in the real presence of the Eucharist. Right. It's this idea of you know, seeing past the substance there, or seeing past well, the physical th- presence and going more into the substantial stuff. I think, think thinking of it like this, or the, the, the notion of the arduous good, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it's, you have to work for a greater, it, it, it's like sports, you know, you want to win the championship, but what that means, it, it's not you just get to hold the trophy at the end. You you have to account for waking up at 4 a.m., getting up, doing all these practices and things like that. But people don't want to do that. People don't want, they just want the trophy at the end. And oftentimes with, with re- religion or with Catholicism in general, like I think it's a struggle sometimes to not uh, to, uh, to not lose sight of the, uh, the trophy at the end, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. And so oftentimes it's like, Okay, I can I can wake up real. I can practice. I can train. You know, or I can hop on this video game that kind of brings me the immediate satisfaction. However, uh, diminished, but it is a more immediate gratification. But you're you're act you're you're indulging in something lesser, because you don't really have to work for it. It's there. You can indulge whenever you want, and I think that it, it definitely ties in again, Alfonso, to what you were saying. You, let's give me the artificial. Give me the lesser thing. I don't want to. <laughs> Who likes to work, you know? And so, but yeah, Conrad, I think to answer your question, the arduous good, the, the notion of it is that it's not easy. You work for it and it sucks sometimes, but you continue to work for it because you know that the reason, you know that what you're working for is such a great thing. And then when you finally achieve it, it's like, nice, you know, the 4 a.m.s were worth it. You know, you, you finally get the, the Stanley Cup or the Larry O'Brien trophy at the end of it. And you're like, nice, all of this hard work, it, it, it all points to something far greater as opposed to, okay, I was just playing 2K all day, <laughs> you know, and it's like, one's fun and it definitely has its place, maybe, maybe, Except and maybe that's a different topic. But. In this case, though, like the, the good in the end of the trophy, you know, it's our final end. Right. It's that ultimate good that, that Aristotle says that we're all... Right. Um, all by, actions are on account of. Yeah, by, just like, by um, necessity, we're drawn towards this mm-hmm. final end. And Gabe, it's an excellent point you made, like the arduous good, and I'm happy you got him to expand upon that. Because when you look at it, you need to have love of something in mm-hmm. order to have this perseverance. It's it's love, right? You need to love something so much that you're willing to die for it. You're willing to live for it and live a tough, challenging life where you sacrifice. And I think from this love of something. And sorry, I know you're you're just no. Working. I just have a question for you, I, yeah. but continue. I, I I definitely I have a question for you. Um, and also before I even beat that to death i have a great expansion on um it's not just wine and bread everything that the church has loved and valued is is under attack and you see that let's say uh, as an italian myself olive oil is you know green gold okay and it's running time, through his veins <laughs> and the church uses it in the sacraments but what does the mafia do the mafia perverts it by cutting it by bastardizing it, filling it with are the are the make good things. movies though. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, this is true. <laughs> but like soy oil, they'll cut soy oil or canola oil and throw it in instead of olive oil. So you don't know if you're getting pure stuff. Beeswax too, they'll they'll cut beeswax and they'll fill it with soy. Right. Soy wax, um, 
honey. They'll also cut that too, and they'll put it with corn syrup. All these things that are very precious and good, they'll attack. Salt, we also see how we'll strip salt, we'll bleach it, refine it, then give it back to people in their Big Macs and kill them with it, rather than it being something used to save their souls mm -hmm. through exorcisms and blessings. Now, can I, can I ask you something, though? Because I think this... It, it's... I. You know, at first when I saw the itinerary for this topic, I was like, "How? What are we gonna? How? Where is this gonna go?" You know, but I think I'm actually really happy that we're fun, we're we're talking about this. I'm glad that you're not salty. <laughs> Thanks. I, I saw this and I was like, "Mind your own beeswax, Alfonso." <laughs> but um, no, stop whining about this. Okay? <laughs> I want all of this right now. <laughs> Dude, you're all over the place. <laughs> no, but what what okay, I was be, beer clear, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what I was thinking, so Alfonso, again, the notion of the arduous good is being removed, but it, it applies to even things like cultural values and things like that. For instance, okay, premarital sex, you know, you want the easy thing. Boom. You don't want to have to, I don't want to have to wait for marriage. I don't want to have to cherish the person that I love. You know, like all of these sorts of things. You want to pick that fruit while it's, right. while it's there. You, you want it now, you know, and you don't want to have to work for these sorts of things. So too with like the artificial, again, you're offered something lesser and something immediate, something that you can use to gratify whatever, whatever desire that you <laughs> just say it, man. Girls Night Out. Yeah, girl, okay, well, that's, that's a different topic. That's a different, <laughs> we're going to get like sued by Girls Night Out. Like, just, like, I, I, I'm not, out. I'm endorsing that. Oh, oh, I'm expecting a check. <laughs> yeah, but um, no, it's interesting. So my question, Alfonso and Conrad, is... When when you have these values that as a culture we're so attached to, like the arduous good, I'm gonna I'm gonna wait for if it's something like the premarital and postmarital <laughs> sex, you know, something like that. I, I um postmarital isn't like after the divorce or I hope not. Or no no no. But I, I, what what were you saying about like having such a great and profound love for something that you're willing to put off the easy things in order to, to work for it? So as a society and as a culture. How have we degenerated so much that we've lost sight of all that we love? Like, what what is it that's happened? <laughs> well, I think if we're looking at our culture right now, we definitely lost this this um, clear respect for sacrifice. Because right now you see it, you see it with 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 how people are. Like we're so um, like our culture is just kind of ingrained to us this idea of like stay comfortable, stay comfortable mm. with your stuff. Like we'll deliver your food for you. We'll do your job for you. Like we'll make robots to, 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 to build your cars, to, to manufacture your, your, your wonder bread, um, to make your computers and stuff. And like we'll let other people sacrifice right. more in other areas so that you can be more comfortable. And you see this in the West where people are miserable. Mm -hmm. Like people like Every rise, rise in depression. Rates, yeah. You know, rise in suicide and, and, and things like, you know, more of a desire to fill that kind of void in their hearts. Like, you know, there's something not right here. Like I'm missing something. Right. Uh, to quote John Mayer, something's missing. He has all this... He's got all this, um, I think the song was like, I was, I was listening to it, and he's like, oh, he's got all this fame, he's got all this fortune, this money, these girls. Right. But something's missing inside, and it's like, listen, John, like, <laughs> yes, God's got, you gotta, you gotta go, go to God. <laughs> but, 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 but anyways, um, uh, where's it going with this? Uh, but yeah, and so that, so that, I think that ties in well with, with the whole alcoholism problem, because you, you find that our culture is more geared towards, okay, well, if like, if, if, if I can't fill this void that's in myself, and, I, and 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 Father, when I was listening to Mass this morning, Father was was saying this that that you know we find we try to look for God in different things, mm -hmm. and we try to fill this void through relationships, through friendships, through entertainment, through different things. But these things that that are good, you know, friendships, fraternity, they're so good, but they can't right. they can't fill that void that God can fill right you know, through through that love and through that overall gift of 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 um, just the overall gift that God gives us in. In our our journey here on Earth, and uh, can I, can I can I interject briefly, yeah, sure. sorry, Alfonso? But it's so interesting that you bring that up. That now more than ever, things are so accessible. You know, back in the old days, you wanted to talk to somebody, you have to wait till they're home to call them. If you're lucky, you have to send them a letter. All these sorts of things. But now everything is so accessible, so instantaneous, and on paper, it should look like people are happier than ever. You know, we're so comfortable. We're able to drive wherever and get whatever it is that we need we can go to the store whenever we don't have to worry about food shortages at least in the west and we're, we're blessed in that respect or we can talk to whomever it is whenever you know all these sorts of things but it's interesting to see it's interesting to see how i think and i don't i don't want to go out on a limb too too much 
but I think how satanic some of these things are in that it's presented as such such a great thing, such a sweet comfort, you know, that we can get so attached to. Because it is it is very easy to indulge in. We have everything that we want, right? It's it's just a phone call or a text message away. And and it's it's intoxicating. It's so easy to get in to get inebriated on that effect. And it's presented to us as a good. And yet it's not. We remove the notion that we have to work for good things and everything is right in front of us and I think that that it's interesting that it ties into mental health disorders and how they're on the rise when in theory on paper it's like well why is that the case you know people are, it seems like we're more like we're better off than ever and so yeah Alfonso what why is it how have we lost sight of that good why why aren't we working for these things or as Connor is saying why are we so allergic to sacrifice why, why must everything be instantaneous? <laughs> We're just adjusting the mics here, you know, having some fun with the sound uh, soundboard there. But uh, Gabe, beautiful. You guys are brilliant. This is why I'm loving the podcast, just seeing the gears moving in your heads and us just pondering these things. They don't things get much and... exercise. I've got to take them out every once in a while. you got to <laughs> sacrifice more there, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm um, mental working. Oh, I'm no, I'm just so happy right now. I, I'm in love with you guys. I'm in love with God. This world. <laughs> okay. Like uh, um, Alfonso's, you know. <laughs> Alfonso. <laughs> but, uh, so okay, I think I'll I'll hit I'll hit you with something that I've prayed about many a times, and it's it's actually funny when you go back over certain providential scriptural uh, quotations, and you're just like, wow, I did not realize this. You know, how God works in your life sometimes in, in these mystical and mysterious ways. And one of the things is, I really like the Sunday of, in the extraordinary form, the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. Because some of the readings are just so beautiful. And one of them is um, the Gospel of Luke. It's the story of the Good Samaritan, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with. Right. Um, uh, you know, there's a Samaritan that comes and helps a man that's, you know, on the side of the road. And for those that don't know, you can go to... Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 23 to 37, gives you the, the whole story there. That's off his memory, by the way. That's the... Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> I wish. But as I as I read through uh, the gospel passage again, it's funny because there's this one point, and I'm just going to quote uh, the Holy Gospel here. Um, the Samaritan, being on his journey, came near, and seeing him was moved with compassion, and going up to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. And setting him upon his own beast, brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he ga- he took out two pence, and gave to the host and said, "Take care of him. And whatsoever thou shalt spend over and above, I at my return will repay thee." And our Lord says, "Which of these three, in thy opinion, was neighbor to him that fell among the robbers?" But he said, "He that shew- shewed mercy to him." And that's from the Holy Gospel according to Saint Luke. And the reason I bring that up is because. There are three great areas that are battlegrounds that we've lost faith in, we've lost a human lifestyle in, we've become so habituated to vice, to sin, and they're also battlegrounds then to, you know, reconquer uh, the world, to save souls again for God. Right. And I think it's to develop the habit of, you know, being able to sacrifice, to love something so much that, you know, you persevere and you do anything necessary that is good, right, to get you to that that point where you can love something freely, fully, give yourself totally to it. Um, it's going to be liturgy, um, good folk celebrations, and uh, homesteading. And the three go hand in hand. And, you know, you can uh, title this different ways. But I think the homesteading part is this rediscovery of how to make things from their natural state. Right. How to, in these little ways, have these accomplishments of rather than playing Skyrim, and by the way, amazing game. I want to give a shout out to the creators of it. But that's <laughs> it's it's wonderful. At the same time, I would actually recommend young guys, rather than getting trapped in fantasy land, these beautiful video games that are just good art and good music and good story and really like the the thing about Skyrim. This is just a side tangent. It is so Christian and it captures the imaginations of so many young men because it's this beautiful, you know, fairyland kind of thing. Um, obviously, it's, there's no fairies. But if for those that are familiar with the game, you understand the experience. You can get lost in it for hours. What I propose is the exact opposite of get out into the real world, stop playing video games, 
and actually make these small accomplishments by homesteading. You can have the chickens, you know, you can have your rabbits, you can build a house, you can farm some land, you can learn how to make candles, you know, you can go hunting, you can make wine and make all these beautiful gifts from scratch, right? Bake at home, cook your own foods. So the homesteading movement has been this wonderful uh, Western experience of people trying to connect back to the land, trying to learn how to make things from, you know, the bare bones up. And it's awesome because these small accomplishments make you feel proud. And these are gifts that you feel like, wow, I can, I made this and I can give it to someone and not just buy it from a store. We all know the experience, like hand making a card versus buying, you know, a Hallmark card, right? right? Yeah, now right. apply that on a bigger scale and you make things yourself. You know, you, you have your own beehives or you make your own wine each year, or brew your own beer. It's exciting. You bring your brothers together. There's a, you know, something that develops around it. It's a great gift. And then on top of that, from this connection back to God's creation of cultivating the garden, fulfilling that command, which by the way is a very monastic thing. The beauty of the monastic vocation is you pray well. and So you work and pray, right? Or at labor, as St. Benedict says, you pray well with good liturgy, and then you cultivate the land, fulfilling you know God's uh, command to Adam to cultivate, till the garden, right, subdue the earth. And it's awesome because these two harmoniously fuse together by these gifts that you create. Then you offer to God in the holy liturgy. Because uh, here's a small example, you know, as a uh, someone that loves bees, every church candle has to be 51% beeswax. But if you can make the beeswax yourself and then make candles for church. How beautiful is that? You can give that gift. Or if you make the wine for a church, how beautiful. And that's what the early Christians did. That's what the offertory was for, actually. It was not just money. It was Christians would get together, and the fruits that they would bear from the trees at the right time, they would offer to God. Right. And then, and so this is why liturgy is so important, because you give God nothing but the best. The best gold, the best silver, the best linens, the right. best fruits. Everything is given to God because you've cultivated the land. That's ah. why culture comes from cult. Right, because you cultivate the like in, in Latin actually, it's all connected with the same word. Cult is both cultivating the land as well as cultivating your relationship with the gods, right? But it's culture, it's liturgy, all these things blend together. And so you have this love of God by giving him nothing but the best. And from there, there's an old Latin proverb, it's ubi mense, ibi mense, and the Institute of Christ the King, they really emphasize this. Where the table is or where the altar is, there's the table, where the table is, there's the altar. It's you give nothing but the best to God and this is love of God and liturgy, it overflows into folk celebrations. When you have banquets for people, like a wedding feast, right? And when you bring your friends together, you give them nothing but the best. You have, you know, table uh, etiquette and manners, and you give them good wine and good foods, things that you've made yourself and you've prepared, and you have a joyful celebration, and this is love of neighbor now. Now, can I, can I ask, how, why have we lost sight of these, these things? Why aren't we sacrificing and working and... and doing these things ourselves anymore oh man that oh there's so many things in there there's so many things in there and i'll, I'll flush it out more and then we should yeah definitely address some of these things because uh, there's so many attacks that's the problem it's not even always w clear cut one it's a, a multi-pronged attack by the devil you know we could and we've talked about this or mentioned it briefly you know the attack on fatherhood it's from your fathers that you learn to love things, right? You see your father love your mother, love his land, love his country, love his parish. So when men have this love, they pass it on to their sons. So we as men really have to pass it on to those brothers around us. And if we have children or if we're priests, pass it on to our flocks, right? But pass on this love. So manhood, masculinity, that love, imitating our Lord because our Lord it was the ultimate man. He showed us how to be a man and to offer God nothing but perfect sacrifice. A pure, a pure victim, a spotless victim, a holy victim, right? That's from the holy liturgy and that idea of everything coming together. Now, you know, you can, there's so many levels and it depends on where people are at too because there's also a big controversy and this is tying things to something we mentioned earlier, marijuana. You know, Marx talks about how religion is the opiate of the masses and I would actually fight that and say religion obviously is the salvation of the masses, right? It is through reviving homesteading and good folk culture, having good banquets and celebrations with people, having good music, you know, getting the fiddle going and people dancing around and celebrating around a bonfire brings people together, right? Which the government is clearly attacking with the communist agenda, satanic perversion of socializing, or right? destroying that, making us lonely feel like we're in hell. I mean, we have Zoom, so oh, I, I don't know. My bad, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> Banquet over Zoom. <laughs> exactly. But um, you have these three areas, right? 
But and then Marx says, you know, religion is the opiate of the masses. But clearly, that's not the case. We're seeing that it's actually the opposite. But the opiate of the masses now that the government has been pushing is with these lockdowns, right? Create alcoholism, create loneliness and depression. Oh, and guess what? Let's give them marijuana. Let's tell them marijuana is going to be the exact same thing, that it's completely normal and fine, and let's get them hooked on drugs to make them live in la-la land again. Video games, drugs, porn, get them out there, disconnected from reality, fat, lazy, stupid, so that they don't love anything anymore. They're so self-centered, ingrained in themselves, lonely, scared. And you see, so it's not just one thing. It's a multi-pronged attack on so many levels. Mm. And, and it's sad, and there's so many battlegrounds, and it depends on where people are at. Um, so the first thing I always think is we should just definitely reestablish these things in our own lives. Develop a deep prayer life attached to the liturgy, right? Try to connect back to the land. You know, if you have property, have a garden, have something simple like that. Make things yourself, right? And also have good celebrations with friends, right? Hospitality. Be like the ancients. Be like the monks. Bring people in and celebrate, you know, a saint's feast day. Happy Sunday, guys. You know, today is the fourth Sunday after the epiphany, you know, and you, you, you have a glass of wine and you go crazy and you're like, yes, you yeah. know. Um, but Gabe, what were you oh. thinking? Because I'm sure you have things in mind well, too. Well, Conrad, he's he's about to burst. So let's <laughs> yeah, bro, you, <laughs> Alfonso, bro, you just said like so many. There's just like so many parts. Yeah, it, that whole spiel that you like, you went off, and, and I just, I just want to uh, comment on a few. This idea of of really doing your work and doing your work well and having it towards towards a good goal towards like. <laughs> <laughs> it towards towards something like the liturgy, um, that's beautiful. That's awesome. Like it's it's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you got him. You guys got me good with that little finger circle thing. Um, but yeah, no, and that, and that goes back to you know, um, Rerum Navarum, you know, Pope. Right. Pope, um, nice. Pope Leo the Tenth. You know, this idea that you know, do things, do things with great love. Of like, do um, do things towards a good, uh, towards a you know, a proper goal and and. You know this idea like homesteading right owning your own private property this is why the communists are, are a- attacking this notion of private property because well done yes because we don't yes. va- we don't value things when we get them for free you know people like when we got when we got money this summer from from the government you know the, the people really value it right, right. As, as much as as much as they did or if you look at these communist countries you know you look at poland back in the day you look at um at like cuba or like any of these other com- all any of these other countries where people are given their homes like are those homes kept up to date are those are those homes valued no you see it all the time they're they're they're, they're destroyed it's it's dirty it's, it's a mess over there right and and you see this idea that you know you work hard towards something you you um you know put in um all your effort because especially as men you know, we have if we have when we have families if we're called to be to to religious life why not but especially for, for lay people you know we have families we are the head of the household we have to provide for our children and we have to like you know pass on these different uh, these different values we have to pass on these these um these tools these um skills so they can pass on for generations and whatnot and i think with with nowadays kind of to, to answer your question um gabe about why is it so hard these days for people to to go back to that to people to find value in things and to go back to the topic of suffering the tragedy of our modern day is that it's not just suffering, because suffering is you know some like when we do God's will, it's suffering, because there are so many things in this life that are hard that we just have to do. We have to get by. We have, and and, I think, and they're, they're all for good. You know, they're all for the ultimate end. You know, raising kids is a difficult thing. So I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna say I'm, I'm not gonna say that I know what it's like, but you can see it in families. You know, it's a difficult thing trying to work and doing. Right. Doing jobs that may not be fun, but they're towards good, an ultimate good. They're towards a good end. Um, something like like farming, you know, something mm-hmm. like um, I don't know, stone masonry or, or I don't know, carpentry. You know, these these different skills. You know, they they're um, they bring us back to the land, and we're able to provide um, provide for our families and whatnot. But I think what's so difficult now is that. If we want people to change their mind, if we want people to, to go and do these certain things, it's going to require way more than suffering. Mm-hmm. It's, an ec- wow. it's an added level of suffering. There's an additional suffering. Because in the sense that it's like this idea that St. John of the Cross says that 
You know, we don't want to be the carpenter of our own crosses, but every time we choose to do our will rather than God's will, our cross suddenly becomes more heavier than it was before. And the more and more that we choose to do our will becomes more and more heavier. We can't, and people in the modern world, you know, they're stuck. They can't carry this cross because it's gotten so big. Mm -hmm. It's gotten so out of hands that they can't do it on their own. Right. And that's, you see that with, with, with depression. You see that with suicide. You see right. That with, but people who are just so lost and so hopeless, it's like, you know, you can't help but feel bad for these people. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a real tragedy. And you kind of find things like, okay, maybe this, this drug, maybe this fix uh, will help me up, yeah. make me feel a bit better, make me feel good. So that way I, I can't feel the weight of this cross. Right. I can just live my life. I can be happy. I can be free. I can, I can love. I can experience all these great things that other people are doing. But I have this emptiness inside. Mm -hmm. And this cross is weighing me down. The more and more, the more and more I sin, I fall into mortal sin. The more and more I choose to do things that are selfish. Um, the more and more I engage in my my pride or whatnot, it just and these are things that just add on to just it. pile so, up over and over and over. It's like, what do we do as a culture to be free from all this weight that we have? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the answer is, is is fairly clear, but hard to understand. Is that we need grace, right? We need grace, reconciliation, forgiveness, all these things that our church is surrounded on. Confession, you know, yeah. <laughs> Alfonso has, has a book called Pardon and Peace. It's it's, you know, being able to to be rid of all these things that hold us down, all these demons, mm -hmm. all these demons that want to keep us away from God, to keep us away from that freedom that Alfonso is talking about. This joyful celebration, you know, folk music, uh, country music. I don't like country music. But <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> but being with people, being with brothers, being, right? Being able to do hard things, to suffer well but to suffer for a good cause, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to embrace this cross and to embrace the hardships, you know, be like Job and say, you know, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. You know, I am doing everything so that I can go towards my final end, right. just being with my creator. No, oh, go ahead, Alfonso. No, and, and I'll let you go in one second. It is just a beautiful, beautiful way Conrad ended that, you know, that tangent. And I love that prayerfulness, right? And from that same, uh, Mass that was talking about the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, the offertory says, the, the offertory, funny enough, where we right. gather everything, it says, and this is from Exodus, and we're doing Exodus 92 right now, hey, look at that. Moses prayed in the sight of the Lord his God and said, Why, O Lord, is thy indignation enkindled against thy people? Let the anger of thy mind cease. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to whom thou didst swear to give a land flowing with milk and honey. And the Lord was appeased from doing the evil which he had spoken of doing against his people. And that, that was it. It was just right. a beautiful way to you know, carry on with how we're dealing with our people. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's interesting. It's it's interesting to... Um, I, so remember in our Aristotle class um, when, when we opened up the Nicomachean Ethics, and I think the first sentence, or one of the first sentences were, and I'm paraphrasing, but all, all actions are towards some perceived good and or whatever the case is and I think that it's interesting to see how that's manifested in society especially with these artificial things you know all of these sorts of things are presented to us as good things pornography uh, excessive video games drug drug abuse drunkenness all of these sorts of things our culture is propagating is these are great if you're not doing it you should because you're missing out and and it does it does seem appealing at first you know but I think I think it's interesting to to see it's it's like an addiction that our culture is on are on on mass, you know, and I think that that's it's so so dangerous in that respect because everybody's attached to it. And as you were saying, Connor, the more you choose to sin, the the, the larger your cross becomes. So too with addiction, the further you go into it, the harder it becomes to break. And so now, how do we do it? There are very few people offering. Like every, there there are, there are very few people offering a uh, a working remedy. You know, they're, they're, and and that's 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 the interesting thing. I remember I was talking to one of my friends like last year, and what he was saying was that it's so dangerous when when uh, when society is telling you that all of these choices that we're making, pursuit of happiness, you know, um, and and all actions being directed towards that end, or at least what you think is going to bring you happiness, can be dangerous in that. You're, you're you you have no explanation for your dissatisfaction afterwards 
when you're pursuing all of these things that you think are going to bring you happiness, you know, when you're attached to sins of lust and things like that, but but you perceive it to be a good, where do you go for an explanation? It's you can't turn any anywhere, and so that that's why it's it's so dangerous. I feel like you talk to your friends. Why do I feel like this? And they're like, well, maybe you're not pursuing what you want enough. But the problem is, is that you're so entrapped in it that you can't see beyond it. And so what what he was describing was that it again, Conrad. It was exactly what you're saying. It's like this internal desolation. You don't know where you can turn. You know that you have to turn somewhere. You know that the recipe that you're using over and over and over again is not going to bring you good results. And yet that's the only thing that you know. And so I think that that, um, as you were saying, we need grace. But I think that that illuminates our job. Because we, as Catholics, we know that we have the remedy. We know that these are, these are the things that people are addicted to. They're so, their lives are wasting away. And, and, and they want more. They want more. You know, so how do we help them break free from that addiction? How do we help them rid themselves of that spiritual desolation and that depression? And and it was interesting too, what he was saying. And I and I I don't know how how much of this he this was um, a theory that he had, and I thought it was a really neat one. He was talking to me about depression, and what he was saying was that obviously there are times he was saying that it can be like uh, as a result of chemical imbalance or hereditary um, her- hereditary mental disorder or things like that. But what he was saying is, his theory is that sometimes he thinks it's a means by which the soul is communicating to the body, saying, you're not feeding me well. Just so too, when, when you get overweight, when you're lounging around all day and not exercising, these sorts of things, your body's like, hey man, this ain't good. You know, I need to go for a run. I need to do, you know, I can't just keep eating these chips all that, you know, you have to nourish it. So too with the soul. You have to nourish that too. You can't keep indulging in these things that are just going to tighten your cage over and over and you know it's bad for you and so that's what he was saying he was like i think depression might be a means by which your soul is telling your body hey man this is not good for me you need to take care you know you need to nourish me and and i think culturally we are so famished in that respect we are so deprived of natural not artificial goods but natural ones like 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 what you're talking oil uh, want you know like all of these sorts of things it's so perverted we have all this artificial stuff we have these lesser pre- pleasures and 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 I think that that's really served to 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 trap us and be very detrimental so yeah seeing the natural value of things and it's, it's funny I, I hear all the time this uh it's like you can see theology in all things and when you apply it to things like you know bread oil um uh beer um you know the the overall giving of self in, in the marital act. You know these are all things that we find God and we find theology in. and and so yeah no I th- I think I think that's that's just a beautiful beautiful uh, point and, a, and it's a difficult question. Um, but I think it, I, if I if I might try to find a way to answer it, it would be going back to to the natural. Mm-hmm. The natural side of things, going back to the theology of what these things are meant meant to be, and I think it's a problem of not knowing what these things are used for and the ideal ways of which they're used for. Like we don't know what what beer is, right? In the sense of like what, why is it good? I mean, we can kind of guess like, oh, it's good because it makes me feel good, but you know, there's more to it. There than is that. definitely more. We're to missing it. out on so much. And and I know I know we're trying to wrap this up, and I think that this I think this topic is such a good one. We should probably continue some of it into next, yeah, next week's episode. episode I feel sure. like just because there's so much more that can be said. How do we offer these remedies? How do we go about giving it to people? Not uh, uh, more so than just finding it. You know, um, yeah. Uh, sure. So should we? Should may, we... I, may I end with uh, with a quote from good old G.K. Chesterton? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so this is one that we like to like to say a lot here at the college, but. Uh, so J.K. Chesterton says, Drink because you are happy, but never because you are miserable. Never drink when you are wretched without it, or you'll be like the gray-faced gin drinker in the slum. But drink when you would be happy without it, and you will be like the laughing peasant of Italy. Shout out to Alfonso. Woo! <laughs> never, <laughs> drink. Italia. never drink because you need it, for this is the rational drinking, um, and the way to death and hell. But drink because you do not need it. For this is irrational drinking and the ancient health of the world. Yeah. Brilliant. Beautiful. Perfect. Wow. Wow, what more can we ask for? That was just 
Yep. <laughs> I guess he got a weight off his chest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, we'll end with a prayer. Uh, get that, <laughs> wait the joke was just ignored. I got it. I just didn't want to get it, you know, weighed down by it. But uh. <laughs> okay, guys, thanks for listening today. It's been a uh, joy and pleasure to have all of you here with us. Hopefully, on the Sunday or wherever, uh, whenever you're listening, unless you're doing Exodus 90, raise a glass, celebrate well, enjoy God's great gifts, you know, and uh, let's give thanks to God and uh, ask for His prayers and blessings. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearest Lord, we thank you for this day. We honor you. We love you for this Holy Sunday. And we pray, we pray a special prayer that St. Philip Neri and so many saints loved. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, by the light of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of your faithful, Grant that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise, never rejoice in his consolations. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Saint Joseph, terror demons. Pray for us. Amen. Amen.